The parsonage at Haworth stands at the highest point of the village, where the dark terraced houses cling to the steep cobbled streets, just as they did when the Bronte family lived here over a century and a half ago. When the Reverend Patrick Bronte brought his wife and six small children to Haworth in 1820, many of the villagers still worked in their own homes, combing the wool for the spinning and weaving mills, which were becoming so much a part of the landscape. Life expectancy was poor. The average age of death was 25, due to unhealthy working conditions and Haworth's diabolical sanitation. There were no sewers, and the position of the graveyard at the top of the hill, with flat gravestones lying horizontally on the top of the bodies, resulted in a contaminated water supply for the entire village. Despite the findings of the Babbage Report of 1850, it took years for improvements to be made, far too late for the short-lived Bronte sisters. They would have watched the graveyard filling up with friends and acquaintances, unable to escape the imposing headstones by then upright, dominating their every view. For the modern-day visitor, Haworth Parsonage is now a museum, recreating the way of life experienced by Charlotte, Emily and Anne when they were writing, an occupation which brought them solace, escapism and entertainment. Their story is tinged with all the best elements of Victorian melodrama, appallingly tragic but timelessly inspiring, where real writing talent overcame seemingly insurmountable odds to be given a voice as the published word. The Bronte saga began in Ireland, Emdale, County Down with the birth of a baby boy in a traditional two-roomed Irish cabin on St. Patrick's Day, 1777. The eldest of ten, with a Protestant father and a Catholic mother, he was named after the saint and blessed with good fortune, rising to scholarly heights, entering St. John's College, Cambridge to study for a career in the church. This was an exceptional achievement for an Irishman of such humble origins. It was at Cambridge that the name of Bronte first appears, when the young man previously known as Patrick Brundy chose a more distinguished surname. This was perhaps due to Patrick's great admiration for Lord Nelson, who had assumed the title of the Duke of Bronte. Patrick Bronte was ambitious and made the most of his opportunities, becoming curate in several parishes as he furthered his career. He also had literary aspirations and published several volumes of poetry. In 1809, Patrick was appointed assistant curate at All Saints Church, Wellington in Shropshire. Here he became friendly with John Fennell, who was married to a lady of Cornish origin. When the couple took on Woodhouse Grove, a Wesleyan school near Bradford, Mrs Fennell's recently orphaned niece, Maria, aged 29, came from Penzance to help her aunt with domestic duties. Maria Branwell met Patrick Bronte, then aged 35, in July 1812 on one of his visits to examine the pupils in theology. By the August, Maria had agreed to marry Patrick, with the ceremony taking place on the 29th of December. There's little information about Maria, but the few letters that exist from her courtship with Patrick suggest that she was lively and intelligent, with a playful sense of humour, addressing her fiancé as... My dear saucy Pat. As a clergyman, Patrick was an evangelical and was drawn to a curacy at Dewsbury in the West Riding of Yorkshire, which had become the hub of a Wesleyan revival. In an area experiencing immense hardship, the young curate was kept busy with sick visiting and funerals. Between October 1810 and February 1811, there were at least 50 funerals a month, rising to 70 in the November, when on two occasions there were eight burials in one day. Patrick stayed at Dewsbury only 15 months before moving to Hartshead, about five miles away. 
Here he came into close contact with the Luddites, who were protesting violently against new machinery being introduced to the local mills. Patrick told many stories of the battles between the mill owners and workers to his children, and for Charlotte Bronte, his tales were a source of inspiration for her novel, Shirley. While they were at Hartshead, the first two Bronte children were born, Maria in 1814 and Elizabeth in February 1815. The young family then moved to Thornton near Bradford in the May of 1815, providing an increased salary which proved very useful as four more children were born in the next five years. Charlotte on the 21st of April 1816, Branwell on the 26th of June 1817, Emily on July the 30th 1818 and finally Anne on the 17th of January 1820. These were happy years with the Bronte family enjoying an active social life with friends living close by. When Patrick Bronte was offered promotion with more money and a bigger house just five miles across the moors at Haworth, it was a very good opportunity and no one could have predicted the troubles that lay ahead. The Good House, built between 1778 and 1779, had flagstone floors in all of the downstairs rooms and Patrick Bronte's obsessive fear of fire meant that he would not allow curtains at any of the windows or carpets on the floor. Winter must have been cold. But when Emily later wrote about her home, warmth was not a commodity that was lacking. There is a spot mid barren hills where winter howls and driving rain. But if the dreary tempest chills, there is a light that warms again. The house is old, the trees are bare, and moonless bends the misty dome. But what on earth is half so dear, so longed for, as the heart of home? Maria Bronte suffered poor health at Haworth, and all six children contracted scarlet fever in 1821. By the May, it was evident that Mrs. Bronte was very sick. In fact, she was dying slowly and painfully from cancer. It was too much for Patrick to cope with alone while tending to his parish work. So Elizabeth Branwell, Maria's sister, came from Cornwall to care for the ailing and isolated family. Despite the comforting presence of her sister, it's hard to imagine the anguish faced by Mrs. Bronte. Her eldest child, was only seven, and baby Anne was not even two. Knowing that she was leaving six small children to make their own way in the world without a mother distressed her greatly, and her tragically poignant dying words were, Oh God, my poor children. Oh God, my poor children. It was on September the 15th, 1821, that Mrs. Bronte lost her battle for life, the first of the family to be buried at Haworth Church. Aunt Elizabeth, a fine example of Wesleyan Methodism, did not fail in her duty, remaining to look after Patrick Bronte's household. After the warm sunshine of Cornwall, she took a dim view of the cold parsonage in Yorkshire, which would be her home for the rest of her life. As the family adjusted to their sad loss, Patrick tried in vain to find a new mother for his children and a companion for himself. After two proposals to suitable ladies and two adamant refusals, the young father became very withdrawn and distant, even choosing to eat every meal alone. To his little children, he became an austere, strict and unapproachable father, Victorian in the extreme. Whatever his behaviour, however, he unquestionably loved the children and his actions were, in his view, taken only for their own good. In July 1824, the two eldest children, Maria and Elizabeth, were sent away to the clergy daughters' school at Cowan Bridge. Charlotte joined them in August and Emily, aged only six, in the November. Although Charlotte was only eight years old, she never forgot this school 
and its fearsome evangelical headmaster, the Reverend Carus Wilson, and in later years immortalised him as Mr Brocklehurst, the headmaster of Lowood School and tormentor of the heroine in Jane Eyre. Readers are subjected to a harrowing catalogue of child cruelty, without doubt based upon Charlotte's experiences at Cowan Bridge. Mrs Gaskill, Charlotte's friend and biographer, commented that... Miss Bronte more than once said to me that she should not have written what she did of Lowood in Jane Eyre if she thought the place would have been so immediately identified with Cowan Bridge, although there was not a word in her account of the institution but what was true at the time when she knew it. In Jane Eyre, the shortcomings of Lowood are exposed when the school is hit by a typhus epidemic, with many of the poorly fed and cared for pupils dying. This again was based on Charlotte's own childhood memories. Eleven-year-old Maria Bronte became very ill in February 1825 and was sent home to Haworth. She died on the 6th of May and was buried with her mother in Haworth Church. The second sister, Elizabeth, also became ill and returned home on the 31st of May. Patrick Bronte quickly withdrew Charlotte and Emily, and although they were ill, they both recovered. Elizabeth sadly joined her mother and sister in the Bronte family vault, dying on the 15th of July, 1825. The four surviving Bronte children became very close, seeking solace in each other's company out on the wild moors above the parsonage. Aunt Elizabeth taught the girls, with Patrick undertaking his son's education. Even at this early stage, the family expected great things of Branwell as the only son who it was anticipated would provide for his sisters. June the 5th, 1826, was an eventful day in both the Bronte family and the world of literature. Patrick Bronte brought some toy soldiers home for Branwell, an event immortalised by Charlotte. Papa brought Branwell some wooden soldiers at Leeds. When Papa came home it was night and we were in bed, so next morning Branwell came to our door with a box of soldiers. Emily and I jumped out of bed and I snatched up one and exclaimed, This is the Duke of Wellington. It shall be mine. When I said this, Emily likewise took one and said it should be hers when Anne came down and took one also. Mine was the prettiest of the whole and perfect in every part. Emily's was a grave looking fellow, so we called him Gravy. Anne's was a queer little thing, very much like herself. He was called Waiting Boy. Branwell chose Bonaparte. These soldiers inspired the children to create imaginary worlds peopled by heroic characters. Copies of Blackwood's magazine were very popular with the Bronte children. They were passed on to the parsonage and the children started to write their stories down much as if they were creating a magazine. Also works concerning the natural world such as Goldsmith's Grammar of General Geography provided the landscapes for their imaginings, taking them beyond the Yorkshire Moors and the only world they knew. Charlotte and Branwell wrote about the world of Angria, with Emily and Anne showing an independent spirit, splitting away to write about their legends of Gondor, a world that would continue in their letters to each other and diaries for many years. It was never the content, however, that made these stories famous. It was their size. All of the tales are recorded in tiny little books which still remain a source of fascination today the world over. It's interesting to note that Branwell was equally as involved as the girls in these early works of literature. The Bronte children showed considerable intellect and discretion with their stories. The Reverend Bronte, despite his interest in matters military, would have disapproved of his children's handiwork. 
Knowing that their father was extremely short-sighted, the children realized that he would be unable to read the tiny books, thus leaving them free to write what they wished, avoiding any censorship. It's understandable that after the tragic deaths of his two eldest children, as a result of being sent away to school, Patrick Bronte was reluctant to let his surviving offspring venture from home. In a world where industrial change was making an issue of education, with newfound wealth being used to buy into schools for social progression, the Bronte children would have to move beyond the confines of Haworth Parsonage if they wanted to progress in the new age. In the January of 1831, a little before her 15th birthday, Charlotte left Haworth for Miss Wooler's school at Rowhead near Hartshead. I first saw her coming out of a covered cart in very old-fashioned clothes and looking very cold and miserable. She was coming to school at Miss Wooler's. When she appeared in the schoolroom, her dress was changed, but just as old. She looked like a little old woman, so short-sighted that she always appeared to be seeking something and moving her head from side to side to catch a sight of it. She was very shy and nervous and spoke with an Irish accent. The transition to school life was difficult for Charlotte and this description from her fellow pupil and future friend Mary Taylor proves to be very informative. It took Charlotte some time to settle but eventually she blossomed in the educational environment and despite her lack of social grace, her friendship with Mary Taylor and another pupil, Ellen Newsey, would last her whole life long. Charlotte also realised that education could provide an income for young ladies of her situation by either teaching in schools or becoming a governess. Charlotte's success as a pupil saw her welcomed back as a teacher in 1835. It was a good opportunity for Emily to join her sister at Miss Wooler's as a pupil. Even from a young age, Emily was a complex character who often gave the impression of rudeness and clumsiness. She did not fare well at school and was desperately homesick, longing for Haworth and her liberty out on the moors. Seemingly determined to reject her new circumstances, Emily's health failed and Charlotte, who understood her sister better than anyone, felt that she needed to take action. Every morning she woke, the vision of home and the moors rushed on her and darkened and saddened the day that lay before her. Nobody knew what ailed her but me. I felt in my heart she would die if she did not go home and with this conviction obtained her recall. After Emily's departure, Anne took her place at Miss Wooler's, and although equally as shy as Emily, she was better able to cope with her homesickness. Anne was also more attractive than her sisters, as this description from Ellen Newsey explains. Anne, dear gentle Anne, was quite different in appearance from the others. She was her aunt's favorite. Her hair was very pretty, light brown, and fell on her neck in graceful curls. She had lovely violet blue eyes, fine penciled eyebrows, and clear, almost transparent complexion. The two years spent at Miss Wooler's were to be Anne's only formal education. However, by this time, it had become obvious that the early artistic promise shown by Branwell had been suffocated perhaps by his family's high expectations or, more probably, due to his own rather weak nature. Having been sent to London, aiming for the Royal Academy no less, with sufficient finance to study painting, he returns to Haworth in disgrace, the money squandered on drink and drugs. Branwell was not a handsome young man and, like Charlotte, was rather short. So as this self-portrait shows his appearance would have been rather peculiar, particularly when under the influence of alcohol and laudanum. Emily went to teach at Miss Patchett's school, Law Hill, near Halifax, but her time there was short-lived, about six months. Charlotte was suffering from depression teaching at Miss Wooler's, having hallucinatory dreams about her angry and characters. She left in the December of 1838. 
in 1839, Anne became a governess to the Ingham family, and Charlotte took up the same office for the Sidgwick family at Skipton. Being a governess was a difficult occupation, neither servant nor family equal. Anne managed a stay of six months, Charlotte only two. Branwell also tried his hand at education, becoming a tutor to the Postlethwaite family in 1840. Unlike the girls, who left their unsatisfactory posts of their own accord, Branwell was dismissed after six months. Both Anne and Charlotte tried again, with different families. Anne to the Robinsons at Thorpe Green Hall, and Charlotte to the Whites at Rawdon. For Charlotte, it was another disaster, and she left the post in December 1841. Enough was enough. Charlotte described the work of a governess as... Slavery. Hard labour from six in the morning until near eleven at night. Charlotte, therefore, put together a plan to start her own school, which would serve two purposes. One, it would provide an income, while allowing the three sisters to work together, and two, they could remain at their beloved home. Aunt Branwell offered to lend the girls some money to get things started. Preliminary inquiries were not promising, and although Miss Wooler offered Charlotte her school, Charlotte decided that Aunt's money could be put to better use. At this time, Charlotte was receiving letters from Mary Taylor and her sister, who were travelling in Belgium. Charlotte convinced Aunt Branwell that it would be a good investment to send herself and Emily to Belgium so that they would be better qualified to teach foreign languages. The Pension des Demoiselles, kept by Madame Hager in Brussels, was chosen, and Patrick Bronte escorted his daughters there in 1842. The choice of Emily to accompany Charlotte is in some respects puzzling. Emily couldn't cope with the school that was just a few miles from Haworth, so Belgium must have been an extremely daunting prospect. Anne had fared much better at school, and would have been a more logical choice, but after some initial conflict, had settled well with the Robinsons. Also, it is perhaps worth mentioning the Reverend Bronte's new curate, the handsome and flirtatious William Whiteman, who was showing interest in Anne. She was very much in love with him, and this description of their behaviour by Ellen Nussey gives a rare example of romance for one of the sisters. He sits opposite to Anne in church, sighing softly and looking out of the corner of his eyes to win her attention. And Anne is so quiet, her look so downcast. They are a picture. Emily, whatever her reluctance to travel, would have been motivated by the promise that if Charlotte's plan worked, she would never need to leave her beloved Haworth again. The nine months she spent in Belgium were predictably awful for Emily. Socially, she found it hard to mix with the other girls, who often teased her for her strange, old-fashioned dress and manners. She appears to have coped by dedicating herself to her studies, impressing her teachers, who felt she possessed an intellect, something even higher than Charlotte's. The experience doesn't seem to have affected Emily's life, and she certainly didn't use the episode as a source of inspiration. Charlotte, by contrast, was deeply affected by life in Brussels. Monsieur Constantin Hager was very different from the men Charlotte had come into contact with in her sheltered Yorkshire life. He was highly intelligent, educated, fiery, heartily masculine, and at 33, only seven years older than Charlotte. The teacher-pupil relationship proved intoxicating for Charlotte, who fell hopelessly in love with her professor. Her first novel was to be The Professor, based on many of her experiences, as was her later Villette, and even Shirley sees her creator hero in Robert Gerard Moore, who is half Belgian. 
Madame Hager was needless to say not pleased by Charlotte's attention to her husband and she must have been greatly relieved when the Bronte sisters were called back to England in November 1842 after Aunt Bramwell's death on October the 29th. Once home, Emily settled down to keep house for the now ailing Reverend Bronte with Charlotte planning to return to the Hagers as a teacher. Anne had suffered the loss of William Whiteman to cholera in September 1842, but was still with the Robinson family. Branwell's fortunes had gone from bad to worse on the railways. After a brief spell as assistant clerk in charge, he was promoted to clerk in charge at Ludden and Foot Station, but he was soon dismissed for constant and culpable carelessness. Money was missing, and even though he was never actually accused of dishonesty, the implication was hardly appropriate for a vicar's son. When Charlotte left for Brussels in January 1843, Branwell went with Anne to Thorpe Green as tutor to the Robinson boys. The move exacerbated Branwell's ultimate destruction and also proved pretty disastrous for Anne, who had built up such a position of trust with the family. Branwell fell in love with Lydia Robinson, the wife of his employer. Fifteen years older than Branwell, it's probable that she was flattered by his attentions and even encouraged him because he truly believed that she loved him. Poor Anne, caught in the crossfire, left Thorpe Green of her own accord just a month before the Reverend Robinson dismissed Branwell for proceedings bad beyond expression in July of 1845. Branwell went into an immediate self-pitying decline, turning to alcohol and opium for comfort, causing his family great embarrassment. When the Reverend Robinson died a year later, Branwell expected to marry the grieving widow, who may have enjoyed a flirtation with the penniless tutor, but an immediate marriage to a baronet had much greater appeal, and he became, as Emily described him, a hopeless being. Charlotte was equally lovelorn back in Brussels, also suffering from the agonies of unrequited passion. She became more and more jealous of Madame Hager, hating the wife of her heart's desire. Charlotte said that she seems a rosy sugar plum, but I know her to be coloured chalk. Charlotte was desperately lonely and isolated and the fact that she put aside her anti-Catholic prejudices to make confession to a Catholic priest at this time confirms the extent of her unhappiness. She returned to Haworth in January 1844, but her infatuation with Constantine Hager continued, and she wrote letters which were quite hysterical outpourings of her feelings. At first, he tried to limit her to one letter every six months, but even this still annoyed Madame Hager and correspondence ceased. Charlotte wrote this poem, which illustrates her resignation to the circumstances, but not without a degree of hell's fury from a woman scorned. He saw my heart's woe, discovered my soul's anguish, how in fever, in thirst, in atrophy it pined, knew he could heal, yet looked and let it languish, to its moans, spirit deaf, to its pangs, spirit blind. So it was that by the autumn of 1845, all three Bronte sisters were back together at Haworth, but the parsonage was a wretched place. Anne's poem, Domestic Peace, laments their unhappy situation due to Branwell's continuing decline. Unfortunately, in a parish the size of Haworth, the drunken escapades of the vicar's son did not go unnoticed. He was under constant threat of arrest for debt. He wrote to friends asking them to bring him gin, notably John Brown, his drinking companion at the Black Bull. He tried everything he could to get money from the family for drink and repaid them by throwing drunken fits which terrified the other inhabitants of Haworth. 
the sense of shame for the family was immense and the future looked very bleak. Branwell was completely incapable of earning any living and every effort the girls had made had failed. Patrick Bronte had developed cataracts and the sisters were aware that if he could not continue to fulfill his duties, they would be both penniless and homeless. Then, just as all hope seemed lost, Charlotte came across a manuscript of Emily's poems. The quality was unmistakable and Charlotte suggested publication. Patrick Bronte's poems had been published, so why shouldn't those of his daughters be? Emily was furious, feeling that her privacy had been invaded and it took a considerable amount of time and effort to calm her. Anne diplomatically gave Charlotte some of her own poems and as Charlotte also had completed work, it was decided that a volume of verse from all three sisters should be published. With the contribution of ten guineas from each of them, courtesy of a small legacy left by Aunt Branwell, Messrs Aylott and Jones published the work in May of 1846. Personal publicity was the last thing needed at the beleaguered parsonage. Also, the sisters felt it important to conceal their sex, so they chose the male pseudonyms of Curra, Ellis and Acton Bell. It's been suggested that the arrival of Arthur Bell Nichols as the Reverend Bronte's new curate provided the surname. Perhaps on this occasion, coincidence played its part because Arthur Bell Nichols was very unpopular in Haworth at this time and Charlotte's reception of him was to say the least chilly. The writing careers of the Bronte sisters had begun. Sadly, Charlotte's brilliant idea to generate the family's fortune was a complete failure. Only three reviews appeared and although quite favourable, only two copies of the poems were sold. Undaunted and motivated by the stimulus of the writing project, all three girls produced a novel. Charlotte wrote The Professor, a tale of love in a Belgian school. Anne composed Agnes Grey, a tale of life as a governess. And Emily came up with the staggeringly powerful Wuthering Heights. The novels were offered to various publishers, but for 18 months they were refused. At length, the publisher Newby took Wuthering Heights and Agnes Grey, but not The Professor. Charlotte persevered with her story, trying different publishers, but her father's ill health took her to Manchester for his eye operation to remove his cataracts. The very day of the operation saw the return of The Professor, yet again rejected. This time Charlotte turned her thoughts to a new novel and Jane Eyre was started as she nursed her father as he recovered. The Professor was dispatched to Messrs Smith Elder and although they didn't take the novel, they explained their decision in a letter which was sufficiently positive to encourage Charlotte to send them Jane Eyre. The novel went first to William Smith Williams, who found it hard to put the manuscript down, and he was so enthusiastic about it that the young George Smith, the director of the firm, read it for himself, agreeing wholeheartedly with Smith Williams. Jane Eyre was published on October the 16th, 1847, and achieved immediate success with critics and the public. It tells the story of an orphan, one Jane Eyre, who is unfairly treated by the aunt who looks after her and sends her to the appalling Lowood School and the zealous Mr Brocklehurst. The young heroine's independent spirit does not, as first appears, get quashed, but flourishes so that through education she learns self-sufficiency. Plain in appearance, small and ordinary, she goes as a governess to Thornfield Hall often thought to be based on the ridings at Burstall, the home of Charlotte's friend Ellen Newsey. Jane's employer is one of the best loved, most romantic heroes in literature, the dark and mysterious Mr Rochester. The novel was criticised initially for committing 
the highest moral offence a novel writer can, that of making an unworthy character interesting in the eyes of the reader. Rochester falls in love with Jane, who he sees as his salvation, against a background of strange and frightening events. On their wedding day, it is dramatically revealed that Rochester is already married to the insane Bertha Mason, who is locked away at Thornfield. There's great understanding in Charlotte's writing for Rochester's predicament, but despite Jane's love for her Byronic hero, she runs away. After being found by the Rivers family, she has the chance of marrying to become the wife of a missionary. Jane refuses and becomes a teacher before hearing Rochester's voice calling her in her mind. She discovers that Rochester has been left blind after trying to rescue his wife from the fire she started. Bertha dies and Rochester retires from society until found by Jane who can then marry him morally and respectably. The power of the novel is in the writing and the suspense in this extract illustrates this. This was a demonic laugh, low, suppressed and deep, uttered as it seemed at the very keyhole of my chamber door. The head of my bed was near the door and I thought at first the goblin laughter stood at my bedside or rather crouched by my pillow. But I rose, looked round and could see nothing, while as I gazed the unnatural sound was reiterated and I knew it came from behind the panels. My first impulse was to rise and fasten the bolt. My next again was to cry out, Who is there? Wuthering Heights and Agnes Grey were published in December 1847. A small edition, not well printed, and both met with financial failure. Wuthering Heights actually shocked all who came across it. It was described as a strange, inartistic story, full of brutal cruelty and semi-savage love. History would reverse this initial judgment, and of all the novels to be found anywhere in literature, the two main protagonists, Cathy and Heathcliff, evolved as one of the best-known couples of all time. Their story is told by Mr Lockwood, who rents Thrush Cross Grange from the black-hearted Heathcliff at the isolated Wuthering Heights. Wuthering is in fact, as Mr Lockwood explains, a significant provincial adjective descriptive of atmospheric tumult. Which one look at Top Withins, reputedly the inspiration for Wuthering Heights, confirms. Whilst visiting his neighbour, Lockwood gets trapped by the weather and in the night is visited by a ghost. The writing is magnificent and the reader immediately anticipates something dreadful. The intense horror of the nightmare came over me. I tried to draw back my arm, but the hand clung to it and a most melancholy voice sobbed, let me in, let me in. Terror made me cruel and finding it useless to attempt shaking the creature off, I pulled its wrist on the broken pane and rubbed it to and fro till the blood ran down and soaked the bedclothes. When Lockwood screams out, Heathcliff behaves in a most peculiar manner and the reader can't wait for the story to unfold through the capable narrative of Nellie Dean, Lockwood's housekeeper. He got onto the bed and wrenched open the lattice, bursting as he pulled at it into an uncontrollable passion of tears. Come in, come in, he sobbed. Cathy, do come. Oh, do once more. Oh, my heart's darling, hear me this time. Catherine, at last. Heathcliff is an orphan, a foundling taken in by the Earnshaw family at Wuthering Heights, where Nellie Dean is a servant. He grows up with the children, Catherine and Hindley, but when his benefactor, Mr Earnshaw, dies, the already wild Heathcliff is treated very badly. When Catherine denies her love for him and marries the respectable Edgar Linton, Heathcliff goes away and plots his revenge. 
Despite her choice, Catherine can't bear it when Heathcliff, out of spite alone, elopes with Edgar's sister Isabella, taking on a kind of madness which leads to her death. Heathcliff's behaviour becomes demonic, perhaps drawing on elements of Branwell's drunken rages, or perhaps expressing a darker side of Emily herself. It will forever remain a mystery as to how a daughter of a country parson in Victorian England, with little experience of life beyond the Yorkshire Moors, could have created one of the most passionate and dramatic love stories ever written. Anne's novel, Agnes Grey, received little notice, described as a somewhat coarse imitation of one of Miss Austen's charming novels. The story of Agnes is full of loneliness and devotion to duty, and there are many autobiographical elements. The influence of Aunt Branwell's Methodism is also evident, with Anne having been the one most affected by Elizabeth Branwell's faith. Jane Eyre was so successful that a second edition was printed with a dedication to Thackeray, but this was spoiled by Charlotte's disappointment at her sister's failure. Patrick Bronte found Jane Eyre much better than likely, which after his initial alarm was a favourable response. The strange pseudonyms caused some confusion as there was speculation that Curra Bell had written all the novels. Newby was publishing The Tenant of Wildfell Hall by Anne and he tried to cash in on the success of Jane Eyre by selling the new work to an American publisher as the writing of Curra Bell. Smith Elder were most alarmed and complained to Curra Bell. Anxious to avoid any confusion, Charlotte and Anne packed a bag and set off for London to reveal their true identities. Emily was not at all happy about this prospect and continued to use the name of Ellis Bell even though the world knew who she was. The shock of meeting the author of Jane Eyre, who was thought to be a man, in the person of the tiny but formidable Charlotte, was a revelation for George Smith. This was the beginning of a special friendship with George and his mother, entertaining the ladies from Yorkshire in fine fashion. With the encouragement of Smith Elder, who bought up all the remaindered copies of the Bell's poems, Charlotte began to write Shirley. Success had come the Brontes' way at last, and it looked as if life at the parsonage was set to improve. Anne's novel, The Tenant of Wildfell Hall, told the story of Arthur Huntingdon, a dissolute drunkard who destroys himself and almost all those around him. The subject matter was as disapproved of as Wuthering Heights partly due to Arthur's behaviour and partly due to his wife Helen's refusal to admit him to her bedroom, a judgement that shocked the Victorian male ego. Charlotte even felt it necessary to defend Anne's gentle character, saying that The choice of subject was an entire mistake. Nothing less congruous with the writer's nature could be conceived. A similar tragedy to Huntingdon's was being played out at Haworth in front of the sisters' own eyes. Branwell died on September the 24th, 1848, aged 31, after one of his drunken fits. Patrick Bronte was devastated at the loss of his only son, but all must have felt his passing to be a blessed release. Charlotte said, I do not weep from a sense of bereavement, there is no prop withdrawn, no consolation torn away, no dear companion lost. But for the wreck of talent, the ruin of promise, the untimely, dreary extinction of what might have been a burning and shining light. A sad epitaph for her co-producer of their Angrian stories. At Branwell's funeral, Emily caught a cold, which quickly turned to pneumonia, followed by tuberculosis. Strong-willed to the last, no coward soul, as she described herself, she was determined to control her illness, forcing herself to continue in her domestic duties. Eventually, she gasped, 
If you'll send for the doctor, I will see him now. But it was too late. She died on the parsonage sofa the same day, December the 19th, 1848. Emily was 30. Sadly, Anne had also contracted the dreaded consumption, which considering her closeness to Emily, sharing a tiny bedroom was not surprising. Unlike Emily, Anne allowed herself to be treated, but longed for the sea air at Scarborough, where she had visited with the Robinson family. In May 1849, Charlotte and Ellen Newsey took her there, and Anne enjoyed the popular growing seaside resort, even riding in a donkey cart on the sands. The same evening, she watched a beautiful sunset, but died quietly the next day, May the 28th, 1849. For Charlotte, the tragic death of her last remaining sibling was a terrible blow more so because she could not take Anne home to Haworth. So she is the only Bronte not to be buried in the family vault at the little church on the top of the hill. Anne is buried in Scarborough under a gravestone that records her age incorrectly at 28. She was 29. Sad and alone, Charlotte returned to Haworth and her father, turning to her work for consolation. Shirley, her Luddite novel, was completed in August 1849 and was published by Smith Elder in the October. It received good reviews, with Charlotte being accepted on her visits to London as part of the literary scene, meeting such influential characters as Harriet Martineau and George Lewis, a lifelong partner of George Eliot. Life back at the parsonage, however, became desolate, and often Charlotte, despite her success, was terribly sad and tearful. Again, she turned to writing, but found it a difficult task, and it took a year to complete Villette, the name of the town where her story was set, based on Brussels. The heroine, Lucy Snow, shows autobiographical reference to her own position at the Hagers all those years before. Charlotte still evidently carried some bitterness, and her portrayal of Madame Beck owes a great deal to Madame Hager. Perhaps she had never forgiven her for standing in the way of her love for Constantine Hager. Smith Elder were disappointed with the novel, paying just £500 for it. Patrick Bronte, now rather proud of his literary daughter, had hoped for £750. His pride in her also made him furious when his curate, Arthur Bell Nichols, asked for Charlotte's hand in marriage. Patrick threw himself into such a frenzy that Charlotte had to promise to refuse Arthur. Mr. Nichols moved away and later tried again, this time successfully. And in April 1854, Charlotte wrote this letter to Ellen Newsey. In fact, dear Ellen, I am engaged. Mr. Nichols, in the course of a few months, will return to the curacy at Haworth. I stipulated that I would not leave Papa. The couple were married on June the 29th, 1854, at Haworth Church, with the bride given away by her good friend, Miss Wooler. This unusual course of events was due to Patrick Bronte feeling unable to go to the wedding. After a honeymoon in Ireland, meeting Arthur's surprisingly prosperous family, the couple set up home in the parsonage, which held so many memories for the bride. Would, at last, peace and happiness come to the remaining inhabitants? Charlotte was pregnant by 1855, and it looked as if children would again enjoy playing out on the moors above the house. Happiness was short-lived. Charlotte's pregnancy was problematic and she was constantly sick. It's possible that she too had weakened lungs like Emily and Anne and combined with the nausea, this proved too much for her. Charlotte died on the 30th of March, 1855 at the age of 38 with the cause of death recorded as thesis. 
This was a tragic blow for the faithful Arthur Nichols, who had waited so patiently to marry his Charlotte. He stayed with Patrick, the last surviving member of the Bronte family who had outlived all of his six children. Many inaccurate articles were written about Charlotte, which upset the family greatly. Arthur had always warned Charlotte to be careful about what she put in her letters. Patrick Bronte, therefore, asked Charlotte's good friend, the sadly underread Mrs. Gaskill, to write an authentic biography, which was published in March of 1857. The Professor, Charlotte's first novel, was published in the June. Patrick Bronte died at the age of 84 on June the 7th, 1861, after which time Arthur Bell Nichols returned to Ireland, dying in 1906 on December the 2nd, aged 88. Howarth Parsonage still stands to remind those who come here of the years it was occupied by the Bronte family. The graveyard is now softened by the trees that the Reverend Bronte's successor planted to ease the effect of the imposing headstones. Nevertheless, the sheer impact of so many graves is still shocking, and this, combined with the wild moors above the village, begins to explain the basis of the supernatural qualities of the Bronte sisters' work. For the visitors, representing so many different nationalities, wandering the quaint, steep streets of Haworth, Emily's closing lines from Wuthering Heights could easily be reassuring. However, for those who stand amongst the tall graves of the churchyard, there is no such comfort. In this place, it will always be possible to believe that the tormented souls of characters like Heathcliff and Cathy still walk the earth and it's certainly not difficult to imagine the ghosts of Charlotte, Emily and Anne watching the effect of the great Bronte legacy on their beloved Haworth. I lingered round them under that benign sky, watched the moths fluttering among the heath and harebells, listened to the soft wind breathing through the grass, and wondered how anyone could ever imagine unquiet slumbers for the sleepers in that quiet earth.